What's up guys, Jay Martin here, and my guest today is Tavi Costa, the portfolio manager at Crestcat Capital. Now, it's always fun catching up with Tavi. Today was no exception. We talked about a handful of things, including where we should be allocating cash right now. Now, that's a big question, but it's one that I'm trying to answer. I'm looking for anything that is not overvalued and inflated in price, and it's actually quite hard to find asset classes right now that are undervalued. So we spent a bit of time talking about this, and we tried to find something. We also talked about the precious metal sector. Of course, it's a key part of Tavi's focus, a key part of mine. We discussed what to do with positions that you may be built six to eight months ago and have since come down significantly in price. How do you approach your next steps, right? Do you average down? Do you just sit and wait? Do you exit entirely? So I got Tavi to explain how he comes to those conclusions. Now, three things before we begin this interview. Number one, if you enjoy my content, sign up for my newsletter. It's free and I publish every Friday. There's a pinned comment right beneath this video where you can do so. Uh, number two, you know, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating ad revenue. Coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do with that cash is donate it to an organization that is super close to my heart named Zero Ceilings. Zero Ceilings mission is to end youth homelessness. And what they do is provide young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, with employment, with professional support, with life skills and outdoor adventure that empowers them to live healthy and independent lives. Now, when I was a, a young misspent youth, I was transformed by my time spent in the natural environment. I moved up to a super small town, spent years in the mountains and it really transformed me for the better. So. I'd love to be able to pay that forward. The third would be that if you prefer to listen to my content instead of watch it, you can now find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Just search The Jay Martin Show. Okay, here's Tavi Costa. Enjoy. What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation. And that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, and I'm joined right now by Tavi Costa, Portfolio Manager at Crescat Capital. Tavi, it's good to have you back. Hey, Jay, thanks for having me again. Looking forward to this. Always, always love picking your brain and getting an update about what's happening at Crescat. So uh, if anyone's just watching you for the first time on my channel, can you give them the highlight reel? What is Crescat Capital and how do you spend your time, Tavi? Good question. Uh, it's a global macro hedge fund, um, and uh, we've been in, in business since the 90s, really. Uh, so a lot of our strategies go back to 1999. One of them is a large cap strategy. Then we launched the long short in 2000. All of those are still alive and well. And, uh, and then a global macro fund came in 2006 or so with the housing bubble issues that we saw. Uh, and the idea was really to profit on a lot of the macro events that, that has done very well over the years. And in 2018 or so, we decided to launch the Precious Metals uh, Fund, which was really launched in 2020. It took us a while to, to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, we also have separate managed accounts. And, uh, but the hedge funds in the precious metal space are probably one of the most uh, interesting and niche uh, products we've ever launched, uh, looking to, uh, to really profit from uh, and capitalize on this idea of, uh, of owning tangible assets today and buying into not only gold and silver, but buying gold and silver in the ground in the most uh, high quality form that we can do. And uh, how do I spend my time? I spend my time developing macro themes, developing macro models. And uh, I spend a lot of time thinking and, uh, and looking at data and, um, and also managing the portfolio. So it's, it's, a lot of, uh, it's a lot to do. However, really enjoy what I, what I do for a living. And so, and we have a large team of, uh, of smart guys as well behind us. So it's, it's not only mm. me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Okay. So spending a lot of your time developing macro themes, what are some themes right now, Tavi, that are catching your attention that maybe the general public, general public, uh, market hasn't caught up with yet. So, so in my opinion, I'm really focused in this is sort of two prevailing narratives that we have in this, in the markets today with inflation and deflation. I believe there's a lot of significant uh, arguments in both sides of that equation. I think it's important for any portfolio to see uh, that the path of least resistance for the Federal Reserve today is to take the inflationary route. The other route would be to normalize rates and allow, uh, you know, the, the monetary policy to step away from uh, uh, from this dependency of, of policies to uh, to create growth. 
And so how do we how do we position ourselves in a setup where there's almost a vicious cycle where uh, we see inflationary forces? And this goes back to the, the late 80s and beginning of the 90s. We see inflationary forces creeping up. The Federal Reserve has to act on it. Um, and then we see a, a, a financial shock that leads to immediate result from uh, monetary and fiscal stimulus. Um, and then, and then we see sort of this this whole uh, situation feeding into a long term inflationary problem. And so, I think that this is kind of where we are. We've been there for decades right now. Uh, and for me, where it leads to is is the commodity to equity ratio. I've looked at this chart uh, many times. I think it's the most relevant chart you anyone any investor should be looking at. So, as a money manager, I see this chart as an idea not only to buy tangible assets, to buy uh, high quality commodity related projects and, and companies, uh, but also looking for ways of hedging the other side. That ratio could rise in a decline of equity markets. That ratio could rise in a very large increase in commodities. Right. So there's a lot of ways to play this. Um, and so we look for those two asymmetric bets on both sides of, uh, today. Um, yeah. And there's, you know, it's it's quite an interesting uh, exposure in my, in my my opinion and probably the most um, the most prudent way of, of, uh, of exposing yourself for the next few years. Yeah, I love that. And most people who watch my channel are familiar with the decoupling of the equity market and commodities prices, what you're discussing here. You know, it was funny as I was prepping for this conversation, Tavi, I was scraping my brain. I was like, where else will you find the competitive valuations of, of well, either miners or commodities right now? Does anything else on your radar broad strokes, macro thinking, Tavi, where where else can you allocate capital right now in a sector that is massively undervalued? Where's the opportunity? Does anything else come to mind? So outside of natural resources, I think there's some <clears throat> housing plays that may may become uh, important. Some some home, build, home builders may, may be uh, some forms of... Uh, of uh, of making money and the reason for this is because inequality has become such a, a large focus on the fiscal agenda side and clearly to me you know when you look at the ownership of 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 the bottom 50 percent about 40 percent of that comes from real estate and so there is a need to keep more than the, the stock market and other markets uh, in the financial assets uh, realm i would say that the housing market is a, another way of, of owning a tangible asset uh, is is one form of, uh, of of investing is is it the way we're positioned? No, no. So I'm not buying that because I think natural resources are much cheaper and and there's not so much of a link towards the cyclicality of the economy and and how perhaps if we do have a, a major deflationary shock with uh, valuations reaching uh, levels unsustainable levels, which you know you would think that at this point we would have already reached those levels, um, but. Uh, and so that's the issue for me. But I, I do think that there's some value there. I think there's biotechnology companies that could do very well. Uh, it's a tough industry to navigate. I think it's a tough industry because of the uh, valuations are well priced in to, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and you, you just need to know very well what you're doing. It's kind of exploration. You're not buying fundamental data. You're buying uh, into a story in, a, in, a, you know, in a, a business model that perhaps doesn't exist that may do very well. I, I think that there's a lot of things that you can make money on top of that, but uh, it requires a lot of knowledge. The technology space is, does not, you know, I think there's way too many people. It's a very crowded space. It's been crowded for a long time. Software and, uh, you know, some folks investing in the metaverse and all those things. I think there's way too many people investing in those, uh, uh, those ideas as a whole. Uh, I think those are going to become uh, more and more, uh, you know, very popular ideas, uh, but uh uh, I like to look at more in the contrarian form. Uh, emerging markets, there's some emerging markets that look interesting. I like to own any asset that that really uh, is capable of making money on the tangible asset side, but also paying their uh, employees and paying their costs in general, all uh, in local currency terms. I believe there's a lot of value to be created in that. Uh, so those are you know some some ideas outside of it, but I can only speak for my portfolio exposure, which is natural resources and some hedges. And so um, mm. that's really what we've, we've been doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because, you know, my question comes from a place of, of personal interest, right? Like I, we manage our, our household finances kind of like many small funds. We have a, you know, a Bitcoin allocation, we have an equity allocation and I'm, I'm heavily weighted in the speculative side, natural resources, mainly, you know, I eat my own cooking, so to speak. 
Uh, we, you know, we have a physical bullion fund, so to speak. You know, we do accumulate on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, we just internally, my wife and I generated an additional income stream this year. We weren't expecting now that we have it, we're like, where should we allocate this cash to? Right. I feel very overweight junior miners feel satisfied with my Bitcoin, satisfied with our real estate holdings. Where else should we be putting this cash? And at the end of the day, we're like, maybe just dry powder. That's what we're going to do right now. Right. Sit on it and wait for something exciting to appear. Yeah. Um, yeah. I happen to believe, you know, we've been in this consolidation mode for precious metals. You know, we've had this move from August 2018 of about all the way to August 2020 of about 75 percent. It's a very large appreciation of gold prices. We all know gold doesn't move that much that quick. Mm. And for me, that was really leading the way in regards to what the policies and disorder we we're about to see in the following years is precisely what we saw in regards to what, how much money printing we saw along with uh, the fiscal stimulus. Uh, and then gold took a pause and uh, and I think gold not only looks cheap relative to equities, but relative to um, uh, to the monetary base as a whole, but also relative to other commodities right now. And so that's uh, it's one way to see it. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, I'm very bullish uh, on precious metals. I've, I've, I've always been bullish in the last uh, two to three years, I, I should say. But definitely uh, right now, given the sentiment, uh, it's uh, it's something I'm uh, I'm very um, uh, focused on. Uh, however. I do think there's ways of, of investing in the crypto world as well. It's just uh, uh, the traditional way does not attract me so much. I do think that there, you know, there, there are people that with the, act, the right expertise that could perhaps navigate that in a better way that I would. Uh, I'm looking for a niche form of you know exploration, as you know, is is uh, there is a floodgate of liquidity from from a lot of the the companies that are at this metal prices are becoming so profitable. And at some point, we're going to see an m a cycle here. And that m a you know, from, from a, a macro perspective, you're always looking for liquidity. And that's one form of liquidity. That's not to say the macro side is going to go well. It's just looking at, uh, naturally, those companies will look for replenishing those uh, reserves. And so, I think that it's going to be a lot of uh, um, a lot of opportunities there. Dry powder sounds interesting too, um, but I, I I'm actually uh, allocating more capital on on the junior space right now than uh, than we've been in the last uh, months or so. You are, and are you are you averaging down on positions you may have built six months ago that have depreciated, so therefore you like them more now because they're cheaper. Or are you sourcing new opportunities? I mean, I imagine both, but talk to me about the positions you built, you know, six, eight months ago that are down today. And how do you approach that decision making where it's like, okay, the company's not what I thought it was, they're not doing what I thought they were going to, the drill results results aren't what I hoped they would be, versus it's still the same story. It's just cheaper now. It's it's a very good point, and unfortunately, you have to learn how to dis distinguish that. You know, bad results is part of the game. I remember, you know, when Labrador had one bad results was down 30%, everyone hated it. And then, you know, and then just uh, talking about Labrador Gold and uh, Gold in uh, Newfoundland, uh, and then it took off later after that. And so, and so there's a lot of, you know, distinguishing what's, what's bad and what's good. It's, it's not an easy game, but we try to lead, you know, let our winners run. Um, so if we have a winner, if we do believe that that's a winner, uh, we we'll not only let it run, but we also add to the position. So there's not really limitation of size um, that that position can really get to. Uh, now, to your other question of trimming, if you know we we do internal calculations of how do we how do we think about the Lausanne curve in a more quantifiable way? What's you now how much value can it really be created in the Lausanne curve of the exploration side of that? So we've been trying to quantify that internally of what we think those companies will be worth at the peak of the Lausanne curve. We've been doing pretty well on that. So as, as we approach that value, we start uh, exiting those companies or looking for other ways of exiting that uh, position. Perhaps uh, uh, there's a lot of ways from, especially from an m and side of things. Um, but um, we've done a lot of work on this uh, in, in our own portfolio and uh, we have a pretty good idea at least of what we think internally those companies should be worth and if they are falling into the category of what you just said where the story has changed where 
perhaps the numbers came out and the deposit, the size of the deposit isn't necessarily as valuable as we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that happens, certainly. I mean, we've got over 95 deals. Obviously, we're going to get a lot of stuff wrong. It's part of the game. Um, and um, the way we approach this, if, if the story has changed, we will uh, we will sell it. You know, we'll, we'll look for an exit uh, plan. And it's not easy because those are very liquid assets. But we've been actually very uh, successful in, in being active every day and looking for things that, um, you know, perhaps are not. So we score every company from zero to 10 in our models. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the exploration side. And if they're, if they're a tens and they're down 15, 20%, we'll look for ways of adding money in that. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if they fall into the rank because of bad due results or anything like that, um, then, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we need more data. So in other, in other words, sometimes um, I think we need to, uh, to see a little bit more of the exploration program to, uh, to have an opinion. In those circumstances, we don't add. We just leave the way it is and, and watch uh, the company closely. Um, but so, you know, letting the winners run has been something that's, that's worked very well for us. I think there's a lot of what you see in exploration space quite a lot is, is, uh, is people selling way before uh, really being able to, uh, uh, to see the real value of those deposits in the long term. And so having some form of, of principle, a value principle of quantifying the actual value you think that should be worth in that deposit over time, and what's the value on a bull market for gold and a bear market for gold, you know, having all those scenarios is really important to uh, know the timing of exiting or, or adding to your position and, and being flexible when things change and the facts change, well, then you should change your opinion as well. Mm. Um, luckily, we haven't had a lot of you know, cases, but uh, we've, we've had a lot of uh, good successes. Uh, a lot of companies were very, very uh, proud to be involved. You know, Goliath Resources is one that is new, that is uh, uh, kind of doing very well, I would say, in the last 12 months. ASCII Mining is a more well-known company in the exploration space that has been doing very well. We're really looking forward um, you know, there's Newfound Gold became very famous now, but uh, Labrador is another one that we really like still. Um, and, um, but, you know, Kingfisher is going to be one that we're watching very closely that we think there's could be worth a lot more than it's worth today. Firefox, um, there's a lot of very interesting names. And, mm. uh, uh, um, so, so any, any, anyhow, Snow Line is another one. And there are others that didn't work very well. I, I don't want to name them because I don't want to, uh, bash on those names at all. But, uh, um, they're, they're, you know, maybe, 15 other 20 companies that have not worked well at all, uh, given the geology results that we saw. And uh, we had to look for ways of exiting those those investments. That's part of the game. Yeah, part of exactly. The game. Okay, now, now you're very active on Twitter. Um, you're very well known for your charts. People love your charts. I love your charts, Tavi. Uh, very active in the market. Um, Talk to me about how would you describe investor sentiment towards the precious metal sector uh, like six, nine months ago versus today? Have, has sentiment changed? And if so, in what direction? Jay, people are tired. They're tired of waiting. They're tired of, uh, of, uh, of the old, um, you know, argument for gold and silver of uh, negative interest rates and, uh, and um, the point of buying tangible assets, the monetary um, you know, buy monetary assets as a whole in order to protect against uh, capital dilution uh, being caused by the Federal Reserve and other uh, central banks. Um, you know, I think people are really, really tired is probably the best word mm. to describe how investors are today. Um, and that's usually good signs <laughs> of, uh, of adding to your position. I remember this very well, maybe two, three weeks ago, uh, when we had this smackdown gold prices on a Sunday, mm -hmm. uh, gosh, I mean, what was the sentiment at that time? It was brutal. Um, and then things shifted right when prices began to, uh, uh, to hit a bottom at that level. Uh, I think, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have the crystal ball. But certainly, it seems to me that we're with uh, you know, gold has been in this range all the way back to 2011. We reached those levels in a quarterly candle, um, and uh, we went to new highs, and then gold lost a little bit of momentum, and then fall, fell into this range. And now we are consolidated for so long. And the question really is: Is this consolidation at the end of a move? Um, I don't, really don't think it's the end of one at all. I think the policies that 
the in the macro drivers uh, behind gold uh, are still in place. The, the, the you know the the macro thesis remains intact. I like to say, um, and you know as a as a sentiment trader, any any person who enjoys looking at sentiment. Um, you know, I really think that we have reached those levels where uh, gold and silver look really attractive uh, uh, from a negative uh, sentiment uh, standpoint. I think I think that it's um, you know it's it's really oversold in some uh, in some aspects uh, technically, especially uh, two to three weeks ago. And the, the funny thing is that people start to uh, uh, you know, especially when you see what's happening in the crypto world, where things have been developing very well until. You know, an hour ago, with the news of uh, El Salvador and Bitcoin's down what, over ten percent, uh, but but you know, it's clear to me that you know people are chasing performance, uh, and, and they've always done that. I mean, it's always the case, and so um, I like to buy into a contrarian play. And you know, if I go to a social setting and I hear someone buying, uh, looking for properties to look gold and, for gold and silver in the ground, uh, I haven't really heard that yet, and I hear a lot of ideas on the crypto markets but uh, not so much in this uh in the space of natural resources and that's really the highway to go from the old economy to the new economy and why i think it's kind of inevitable that this demand will drive prices higher uh given also the issues with supply that we see in so mm. many different forms so uh long way to answer your question but i think sentiment is is uh is not uh, not only negative, but people are just really tired. And a lot of people saying, you know, uh, you know, if you think that gold is manipulated and all that, I mean, probably you shouldn't be dealing with gold anyways, because it's, you know, if you think it's going to be the case going forward, right. um, you know, maybe you shouldn't be. I happen to believe that the macro drivers are much stronger than anything else. And at some point, central banks will be forced to improve the quality of their international reserves. Um, you know, we're seeing this in places like Brazil, Turkey, and so forth. And as we lead to, you know, we saw this, this discipli uh, uh, discipline kind of coming off in terms of uh, the seatbelt of the disciplinary seatbelt came off in the 70s. And there has to be a, it's kind of like a rude awakening of, of folks really trying to get that back on, um, building a whole parallel system in the crypto world. Yeah. Uh, and in my opinion, this need for better and higher quality reserves is just at the beginning where I think gold is going to play a very important role into that. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, you know what? I feel very similar about the sentiment shift. It makes me super bullish. I've been more active in the market during the last month than I have been for the last five, probably. You know, yeah. I was I was loving the positions I was in, sitting on them comfortably, and then actually started increasing allocations in a few of them in the last 45 days for that reason exactly. Well, look, a lot of the exploration names, as you know, probably down pretty good already. You know, some of them down 50%, 40% from the peak. And so yeah. and if you like those names, you know, it's usually the time to, to pick those those names uh, as, a, as an opportunity. But um, I was just looking at a chart of platinum, you know, broke out in a long-term chart, you know, 14-year resistance that now became a support and then comes down and touches that support again. Uh, it looks really interesting as a long-term trade. I mean, so does gold and so does silver. So mm. um, nothing has changed. It's just the sentiment is so negative. And there's so many other opportunities that have worked that uh, people have lost focus. Right, right. Okay. Look, Tavi, um, where can people find out more about your fund? Can they get involved in Crescat? Talk to me a little bit about that. Our website is is very open. Uh, believe it or not, we actually offer a lot of uh, um, you know very uh, tra very transparent website with a lot of information, monthly performance. Um, everything is in that website in regards to the structure of the funds. Uh, the Crescat.net is what I'm referring to. Um, if you just type Crescat, it's the first thing. It's probably going to show up on the, on Google uh, search. Um, you can also find me on Twitter, or um, you know, I think I'm very easy to find. If you type Tavi Coast on Twitter, you're probably going to find me. Um, and you know, I, you always message me if you if you have any questions. But uh, we try to do weekly presentations about companies we get involved um, as well. Um, you know, with Quentin Haney, I think it's. Uh, uh, it's a learning curve for me. Geology has been a learning curve. Mm. I'm not a geologist, and uh, 
Um, I see this from a macro uh, setup, and uh, but it's a, it's fascinating to see the the, the lack of folks uh, really uh, looking into uh, this industry as an opportunity. And so um, I really really like this uh, as a, as a setup for for investing. So Kraska has been uh, very focused on building a portfolio of ideas into this space and maybe uh, acting with the long term mentality of trying to uh, quantify this entire uh, uh, Lausson curve on the exploration side, the very left of the Lausson curve, as we like to say, the discovery mm. phase. And uh, I think there's so much to, uh, um, uh, to be unlocked of value in that, in that part of the, of the market still. And uh, uh, we're going to see, you know, we want to be involved with one of the largest discoveries in the, last, in the next few years. And I think we've been, um, you know, I think we have a lot of that on that front. I mean, newfound gold and ASCII mining and Eloro, um, you know, those are major ones, Cabral in Brazil and uh, Defiance in Mexico. I mean, those are all companies we've been involved from the very beginning in a lot of those cases uh, since the beginning of the fund and some of them pre-IPO, depending on the story. So um, really, really cool development. So uh, I think uh, if, you, if you're looking for that type of investment, I think that that's, uh, that's what we offer, I guess. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And uh, hopefully, we're going to get you up to Vancouver in January at my show. Let's do it. I don't know. Like I guess I don't know if we sent you the information yet, but uh, I'd love to fly up, host you at the show. It's tons of fun. It's just like a big party for people that like the commodity space. <laughs> and uh, we all get together and share ideas, tons of companies, tons of investors, tons of great people. Um, and fingers crossed, we're back in action in person, January, 2022. So anyways, okay, Tavi, thanks so much for coming back on. It was great catching up with you. Hey, thanks for having me, Jay, again. And uh, we'll look forward to, to uh, talking to you again. Okay, guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But co coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.